Welcome to the Gastrointestinal Physiology Part 2. My name is Veronica and in this presentation I will focus on the physiology of the large intestine, I will highlight the intestinal microbiota and finally discuss the innervation of the gastrointestinal tract. First, I would like to start with a picture of the large intestine, which is the most distal segment of the gastrointestinal tract. Here we can see the appendix, the ascending colon, then the transverse colon, and the descending colon, and then the last portions as the sigmoid and colon and the rectum leading to the anal canal. I will not go into detail with the anatomy because this is covered uh, in the anatomy lecture. The large intestine receives about 500 milliliters of chyme per day from the small intestine. This received content includes indigestible food residues because most nutrients have been absorbed already in the small intestine. Also, about 500 milligrams of bile acids that are produced by the liver are lost daily in feces. Therefore, the main functions of the large intestine are to digest and absorb what cannot be digested earlier in the GI tract. Second, to reabsorb remaining fluids and salts that were used for the movement of the content and to store the waste products until they can be eliminated. To perform these functions, the large intestine is motile and has transport mechanisms. This way, fluids, electrolytes and other solutes can be reabsorbed, reabsorbed from the stool. Also, the large intestine houses a unique beneficial bacterial ecosystem, or the microbiota, which contributes to certain vitamin synthesis. And finally, of course, the formation and disposal of feces from the body. There are three types of movement that enable mechanical digestion in the large intestine. First, hostile contraction is stimulated when food residues enter the colon. These slow sluggish segmentations happen mainly in transverse and descending columns. These movements uh, push chyme forward and also allow mixing of the food residues. This helps water absorption. Second movement is peristalsis, which is way slower than the small in, in the small intestine. Third, mass movement represents strong waves which begin in the transverse colon. These quick waves push the content toward the rectum. Uh, and these movements occur about three times per day, usually after a meal. Finally, products of the small intestine digestion, as well as stomach filling, lead to gastrocolic reflex. This increases colon motility, including the mass movements. Maybe you have heard that fiber is important in the diet. So this is because fiber enhances contractions in the colon and also it softens the stool. All movements are possible because of the gastrointestinal wall layers as can be seen in the picture. We can see uh, the muscle layers uh, over here. So there are two muscle layers, one is longitudinal and the other one is circular. On this picture, we can see, as I described before, uh, the peristalsis movement, which is this. Um, it occurs um, that there is a contraction between, before the bolus and then that allows for the movement of the bolus in this direction. Uh, and in comparison, the second part uh, of this picture is the segmentation, which is rather for breaking apart the bolus. Most bacteria entering the alimentary canal are killed by hydrochloric acid and protective enzymes, but the large intestine contains trillions of microorganisms that live in symbiotic relationship with their human hosts. These bacteria are crucial for maintaining our health because they metabolize substances that can, humans cannot. They metabolize endogenous substances such as bile acids or bilirubin, but also exogenous drugs. 
Here on this picture, we can observe that the microbiome of the large intestine is very diverse. Bacteria uh, in the human body actually makes up roughly half of the cells in our body, which can be seen on this uh, picture comparing the number of human cells and bacterial cells, which is very shocking. Bacteria therefore participate in the chemical digestion, specifically saccharolytic fermentation or breaking down of remaining carbohydrates. The process of carbohydrate metabolism generates methane, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen gases, which contributes to the formation of gas in the colon. Uh, the microbiome also helps the absorption of vital minerals such as magnesium, zinc, or calcium. Importantly, bacterial flora facilitates, facilitates synthesis of certain vitamins such as biotin, vitamin K, or vitamin B. Finally, uh, the microbiome protects the colonic epithelium from pathogens and supports the mucosa. On this picture, we can see that the good gut microbiome composition can be influenced by our diet, but also changes as we age. Recent research has shown that microbiome disruption or altered gut microbiome may be associated with certain autoimmune disorders or even cancer. Now we're going to look at the absorption of the large intestine. Small intestine already absorb, absorbs 90% of the water. So the large intestine then absorbs the remaining water through the process of stool formation. Water is absorbed through an osmotic gradient, which has the same mechanism as in the small intestine. As we can see on the picture, sodium ions are transported from the lumen at the apical side of the epithelium. In response to that, water follows and is also absorbed. This, this side is basically where the food is, uh, where the lumen of the large intestine can be found. Um, sodium potassium pumps then actively um, transport sodium to the basolateral side of the large intestinal uh, epithelial cells. It is important to note that water absorption is very efficient in the colon because it is enhanced by the function of aldosterone uh, hormone. Chloride is also absorbed by exchange with bicarbonate. Here we can see chloride. Bicar bicarbonate secretion into the lumen neutralizes uh, acids from fermentation. Then mucus is secreted by goblet cells in the colonic ep epithelium. It lubricates the lumen, protects the epithelium, and helps binding dehydrated substances from the feces. Here we can see the goblet cells. Uh, it's a histological section. Uh, here we can see uh, the comparison between the small and large intestinal uh, walls. Um, it is interesting to note that the, the crypts here um, are a little larger than uh, in the large intestine. Now we go in the feces formation. The normal feces are roughly 75% of water and 25% of solids because water helps for smoother defecation. Solid component is composed of unabsorbed substances, bacteria, undigested food residues, all epithelial cells from the GI tract, and also inorganic salts. For better imagination of this mechanism, so about 500 milliliters of food enters the large intestine, but only 150 milliliters become feces. So there is still a lot of reabsorption in the large intestine. The brown color is due to ster stercobilin and urobilin, which are produced by bacterial degradation of bilirubin. 
Bristol stool chart is used to classify the type of stool that is passed. It helps to identify healthy and abnormal stool as well um, as for how long the stool stayed in the bowel. So here we can see that type 3 and type 4 is the normal stool and uh, by looking at the different types we can see how long um, the stool stayed uh, in the large intestine because the longer it stayed the uh, less water content it has. So the process of defecation. So there is a mass movement of feces towards the rectum which provokes the defecation reflex of feces elimination. This distension reflex is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system by signals from the spinal cord. Neural signals lead to sigmoid colon and rectal contraction, which involuntarily relaxes the internal and external sphincter. If voluntary relaxation follows, the feces will then be discharged. But if there is no voluntary relaxation, feces will move back to the sigmoid colon until the next wave of peristalsis. Finally, uh, rectum muscle contracts to expel feces. Now I would like to discuss the large intestine vasculature briefly. Here is a very simplified picture showing the blood supply of the large intestine. Have a look at the superior mesenteric artery uh, because that will be shown in the next picture. All vascular plexuses are connected in a long channel running through the whole length of the intestine. Here is a blood forming um, from the superior uh, mesenteric artery which we can be see here um, and you can see the connection to the large intestine. Here in the picture done by a scanning electron microscope on the right you can see the surface of the vascular bed from the view of a lumen um, in a large intestine. The vasculature forms a very neat and highly organized structures. Uh, it is very dense um, and you can also see the crypts. I would like to highlight uh, ischemic colitis, which affects the colon usually or in older people. This disease is characterized by inflammation or injury of the colon as a result of decreased blood flow in the associated vasculature. This can be caused by atherosclerosis, blood clots, low blood pressure or bowel obstruction. The symptoms of ischemic colitis include abdominal pain, blood in the stool, diarrhea or nausea. Finally, the treatment of ischemic colitis uh, focuses on eradicating the inflammation, usually by antibiotics, but also treating the underlying causes of this disease. Also, surgery can be performed to repair the damaged tissue and the intestines or to prevent leakage. Um, and uh, also it is possible to remove parts of the colon that was uh, inflamed. Now uh, I will focus on the innervation of the whole uh, gastrointestinal tract. Enteric nervous system or the mini brain gut, um, gut brain belongs to the autonomic division and has both parasympathetic and sympathetic portions. And we can see that over here. So here is the autonomic nervous system and it has both sympathetic and parasympathetic portions. Um, uh, the nervous tissue of the gastrointestinal tract is however different from other autonomic portions in a way that its neurons don't receive direct input from the central nervous system, which allows digestion to proceed independently. So the neural information comes from autonomic neurons that are both sympathetic and parasympathetic, and also from gastrointestinal sensory neurons. This leads to reflexes that act independently of the brain or the spinal cord. So the role of the enteric system is to regulate movement and secretion of the GI tract. 
that additionally the central nervous system regulates the turnover rate of the GI mucosal cells. Parasympathetic neurons can be found in both submucosal or um, also called the Meissner's plexus, but also in the myenteric or orbax plexus. Together, they form a functional unit for the integration of electrical activity at multiple locations. The myenteric plexus lines the whole GI tract and it regulates the enzymatic release from organs and controls muscle activity of the GI tract. This way it can generate peristaltic, uh, peristaltic waves. So this plexus also controls secretions of inhibitory peptides, which inhibits finsters. The submucosal plexal, plexus, on the other hand, uh, has local functions. It contains sensory cells that, as I previously said, they communicate with the myenteric plexus. But the, in contrast, the submucosal plexus stimulates secretions in the lumen as well as absorption. So the enteric nervous system is connected to the central nervous system via sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways, forming the brain-gut axis. Here, we can see four levels of the brain-gut axis control um, the and the synapses involved, which is um, shown by the dots. If we compare the sympathetic and the parasympathetic enteric nervous system, we can see that the parasympathetic stimulation of the ENS leads to increased blood flow, secretion, and muscular activity. Uh, and this basically uh, stimulates the digestion. But uh, in contrast, the sympathetic um, act acts in, um, in the opposite uh, way. Here we can see the overview of the enteric nervous system, which I will discuss uh, further in detail. We can see that the enteric nervous system contains sensory and motor neurons, as well as interneurons that integrate information within the GI tract. This creates integrative circuits between ganglia, processing information, and sensory receptors in the mucosa. These receptors sense volume, fluidity, chemical composition, and lumen temperature. Here, intrinsic primary efferent neurons connect to these interneurons, and uh, this then controls modern neurons of the GI musculature and secretion. I will clarify that a little later. On the other hand, the extrinsic GI tract innervation transmits sensory info to the brain and the spinal cord via the parasympathetic and uh, sympathetic pathways. Sensory information is transmitted to the GI tract to the brainstem and spinal cord via vagal and spinal efferents. This includes the splanchnic and pelvic pathways. Efferents are involved in vomiting, nausea, feeding, and satiety, but also uh, in pathophysiological visceral pain, which I will focus on later. Motor or efferents of the enteric nervous system can be divided in parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. First, the parasympathetic connects the cranial and sacral spinal cord with the GI tract through the vagus and pelvic splanchnic nerve. In contrast, the sympathetic originates in the thora thoracolumbar spinal cord region and leads to the celiac ganglion that branches further. It is important to note that nerves of the splanchnic system are both involved in Efferent systems, but also from the previous slides, splanchic nerves are involved in the afferent connections as well. Lastly, I would like to highlight a pathology associated with the innervation of the GI tract. Irritable uh, bowel syndrome occur occurs as an association of symptoms, among which are abdominal pain, diarrhea, or mucus in the stool. 
It can be caused by stronger contractions in the intestines, inflammation, infection, or changes in the microbiome. However, I would like to focus on the neurobiological abnormalities that may cause oversensitization to normal stretching. Basically, in this case, there is poor coordination of signals between the brain and the intestines. It is the gut efferents that may be involved in the pathophysiological visceral pain. Extrinsic pain receptors respond to stretch, pH, bacterial or immune cell products, but uh, also to neurotransmitters. These nociceptors can be found in all layers uh, of the GI tract wall and transmit pain signals to the brain via the spinothalamic tract and the dorsal column. This is then relayed to the higher cortical areas to localize the signal, but also to perceive the painful feeling in the limbic system. Normally, these pain signals are counteracted by the inhibitory circuit uh, through the spinal cord again, but according to the latest research, this is suggested to be car carried by the vagal transmission. Um, however, in the pathological condition, this balance can be disrupted by either visceral or central sensitization. In the first case, sensitization originates in the gut, uh, can result from epithelial damage by toxins, antigens, or inflammation that uh, excessively activate these pain receptors. In the second case, sensitization can also occur in the central nervous system, which is characteristic of chronic inflammation uh, or injury in the GI tract. So um, this can lead to changes in receptors and channels and affect signal transmission in the central nervous system. As the irritable bowel syndrome is linked uh, to the trigger by stress, treatment includes uh, counseling and stress management, dietary changes, but also treatment by certain drugs is possible. So here are my references that were used for this presentation. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, this physiology presentation. If you have any questions or something was not clear, uh, you can always email me. So thank you for your attention.